Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. This uh, gospel reading of today, it's a very mysterious uh, teaching, this parable with the brides. You have to know something from the history, from the customs of Israel to understand this teaching of Jesus. The last three parables at the end of Jesus' ministry are the eschatological discourse for the end of time. You don't have to go even to the church to hear from the scientist that there will be the end of the earth. Even the people who have no faith, they declare it because everything what has the beginning has the end. We do not know when, but it surely come. So Jesus is preparing the people of Israel for the crisis moment which they can experience, his passion, his death and resurrection, and what follows from this conclusion of the plan of salvation. Matthew is also preparing the church for so-called the end of time. This is the training for the end time in which we are living and we have some kind of guidance to see if we are on the right or on the wrong side considering our salvation. There are at least two levels in this parable. Who is the bridegroom? And what does it mean that the door was locked? It's quite uh, mysterious. So the virgins represent Christians who are waiting for Christ, for his second coming or for the coming at the moment of death. They must be watchful even if it seems to be a long time. You know, remember, or the young people, they know it, when you are 20, 30, you think you will be living forever and ever and ever. When you experience some kind of death, some kind of disaster on your personal family level, then you know it's not really like this. What does it mean that the door was locked? They could say, excuse me, but we were invited to the party. <coughs> what do you mean you do not know us? And it's really true, because even if you look for our tradition, which is very similar to the Jewish tradition, who are the grooms and who are the maids? the closest friends or family members. So what do you say? You do not know us. The context of it is the Jewish wedding, which was done in two stages. The first stage was to take the vows. And from that moment in Jewish tradition, they were considered wife and husband. Remember, Mother Mary and Joseph, and then they were separated. The bride and the groom were preparing separately for the great day of the consummation of the marriage. On the one very practical way, the groom was obliged to build a house, new house for the family. And traditionally it was between half a year and one year, this preparation for consummation of marriage. The day all young unmarried girls would join the bride on her journey to the meeting place, all the young unmarried men would join the bridegroom to go to meeting place. And this is what Jesus is talking about in today's teaching. Then from the meeting place was a great procession with singing, with dancing, celebrating until leaving the couple alone for their own consummation of marriage. So girls that came much earlier would be waiting for hours. The bride was obviously with them. And together with the bride, they all got sleepy because it was a very, very long time of waiting. So Jesus said in many similar teachings, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. In the parable of the wedding feast just a few weeks ago, those who are invited, they have plenty of excuses not to come to the wedding feast because they were tired of waiting. Even the second invitation didn't help. They were so busy with everything else when the Messiah came they were not ready at all. And this is what was Jesus pointing, you can miss the train. Both Jesus and Matthew are warning us that we can fall into the exact same trap. We might get tired of waiting for the second coming of the Lord. The church declares each day, each holy mass, weekend or weekday, that we await in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
It's not always exactly the same words, but in several of the prefaces is sought in joyful hope. So where is this fear coming to Christian hearts? Don't you know that the second part of our life is much longer, much more glorious in the presence of God? And St. Paul said it so clearly that if our hope as Christians is only here on earth, then we are the most pitiable people from all the people. Because that was not the promise. Christianity doesn't offer anything really for this life. It's a preparation for the life to come. Five brides were foolish and five brides were sensible. Sensible here means having wisdom. You know, this is what uh, somehow came to me. I, I never really pay attention because you focus on the oil, what is the symbolism of the oil. But have you ever asked the question, why five, five? And that's Jesus' example. He could say nine were wise and one was foolish. It would also serve the example. Why it's five, five? And we are used to this parable of Jesus when the good shepherd has hundred sheep, one is lost, he leaves this 99 and going for the one lost. So, okay, 99 are good, only one is hopeless. What about 5-5, 50-50? Five, 50% five? 50, 50. 50 for life, 50% for the culture of death. And it's really dangerous and could be very cruel if there is majority for the culture of death. Because what are the fruits of the culture of death? Death. And you might experience it in a very cruel way. These young women were carrying little lambs that had oil feeding the light. So the whole parable says that the only people who are ready for the Lord whenever he comes are the Christians with their faith burning with love. So how do you know that your faith is burning with love? Good deeds, the spirit of sacrifice, the spirit of service, it's very measurable, you know, you can quickly know which direction you are moving. For some of them, the oil was missing. You know, there are several things which you cannot really share. It is impossible to take love out of one person and to give to somebody else. It's impossible to take your education, you went to the college or to get some job and to give it, just give it to another person. The trouble starts at the very first day of our birth. The child didn't need to worry. Everything was going automatically under the heart of mommy. Now when the child is born, I have to eat and my mommy has to eat. I have to sleep and my mommy has to sleep. I have to be washed, I have to... Everything starts there. And there are many of the things in life which nobody can do directly for you. You can support the person, you can motivate the person, but this other person has to do it for themselves. So love is the issue. And once more, it's not my love, it's not your love. It's the love of God which should come to my heart and from my heart to the others. Only this love is really satisfying. Only this love makes real miracles. Foolishness of these foolish ones it was they started to give attention to the Lord to grow in the spirit too late. And there are such things like too late, you missed the plane. Waiting until the day of death to start to grow in sharing your life with God is really too late. How do you know when you will die? How do you know that you will be remembering everything when you'll be dying? How do you know if you don't practice that at the last minute, even if the death comes somehow by surprise, that you will have still strength and memory to call, Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleison, if you don't pray at all. I'm just explaining, I know that you are praying because you wouldn't be in the church, but just that you can understand for yourself, that you can understand to explain to the others. These women waited until it was too late, and because of that, they were locked out. They missed the train. So in Luke chapter 12 and 13, we find the same teaching as in Matthew, but in a different parable. Guard your loins and light your lamps and be like servant who await their master's return from a wedding ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. And Jesus concluded it, 
you also must be prepared for at an hour you do not expect the Son of Man will come. All predictions of the second coming of Jesus failed and don't even listen to them. No one knows. We can observe the signs that is becoming close, but no one knows when it will come. Someone asked Jesus, Lord, will only a few people be saved? And what Jesus answered? Answer them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. He never made some cheap promises, oh, it would be easy, it would be joyful. I mentioned to you several times this example, even saints fall into this trap. St. Therese of Lisieux, she was writing to her sister Celine, oh, who would like to suffer dancing, smiling, enjoying. And she made us this question, would it be suffering if you can smile, dance, and so on? And she pointed, the merit is in the readiness. When God sends you suffering, you will insert it into the cross of Jesus. You make it useful, productive. That is practically the only choice we have. And you will say, we ate and drank in your company, and you taught in our streets. And then he will say to you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evil doers." Especially pointing you from the different angle that you can see there is something like too late. I still personally hope that at the moment of death, Jesus is still giving us the last chance between this closing of the eyes and the moment of passing to the new dimension. There is still like a moment of decision. It's not written in the Bible, don't have to believe me, but looking at his merciful heart, he will still give you a chance. Would you take it? But if you never take chance here, how do you know you will take it on the other side? Jesus is telling this parable to the people of Israel on his final journey to Jerusalem. That's the end. The next is the passion, resurrection, completing of the plan of salvation. Jesus said, for you, the people of Israel, the door of salvation is opened now. But when the master will rise up in the midst of the resurrection, the door of that particular time will be closed to Israel. That doesn't mean that Israel will be rejected, but this openness, this sheer amount of grace will be like redirected to someone who is ready to receive. You might find yourself on the wrong side of the door. You surely have seen this beautiful romantic picture. Jesus is knocking at my doors, or Jesus is knocking at the heart of my door. You know what is wrong with this picture? Everything. He's on the wrong side of the door. If you don't let him in, it doesn't help if he's knocking at our doors. Let him in. The door represents the opening and closing of the new era. And the door was opened in Rome not so long ago for the great jubilee, and the Pope opened it. Why the door was opened? It was a very great symbol. It was open for the whole year to receive mercy. What about if you would be so busy and you come just one day after this year? You miss the train. It's too late. So Jesus said that with his coming, the door of God's mercy was opened to the whole of Israel in a special way to Israel. With his death, that door was closed for Israel, not in rejection, but as an invitation to the others. The resurrection opened the door of salvation to the Gentiles, and you see the results. Two thousand years and Israel is still lost. This parable of the ten brides emphasizes the warning which Jesus gave to the people of his time before his passion, before his resurrection. This was the time of decision for them, as now is time of decision for us. Choose life, because only this enters his kingdom. We have to choose Christ, his way, his commandments, his style of life, and we cannot be in his kingdom by accident. That's why it's the whole church teaching, to help us to choose, to give us grace to see it, and to make the right choice. 
A sign that somebody made the right decision is the faith burning with love within him, within her, good deeds, the spirit of sacrifice, the spirit of service. It's quite visible if you just honestly look at yourself. There is surely a huge problem in our modern world because love is growing cold. When the oil of love goes down, the light of faith goes down. They depend on each other. And Jesus said this terrifying sentence, terrifying question. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the world? Kind of warning, kind of prophecy, and should motivate us not to lose our trust in God. This appearance of faith means the oil of love is gone. And when the oil of love goes down, violence breaks out everywhere. If you search for some reasons what is happening in our world, that's why. That's why it's easy to see when love goes cold, violence increases, and the respect for human life decreases. When love grows, the respect for human life grows, and peace returns to our hearts and also to the world. So we have a checkpoint in the world to judge for ourselves how healthy we are. Are we? Let us learn something from the wisdom of the saints. You surely heard the name of St. John of the Cross, one of the greatest mystics in our church, in the history of the church. He wrote it. This is from his instructions. Where there is no love, pour love in, and you will draw love out. So whatever you plant, you'll harvest. I remind you this symbol coded in our own bodies. Whatever you point to, one finger, two, the three are coming back. If you point to hate, hate is coming back. If you point to love, love is coming back. One of these uh, most universal proverbs is when you plant wind, you will get back thunder. <laughs> Be aware of it. So have a great love for those who contradict and fail to love you, who do not love you. You know, this was my big struggling. I was quite hurt, my history of, the, of life in the family. And I was questioning this. Why do I have to love people who do not love me, who clearly show that they despise me? Whatever for? What, what is the purpose? And, and I was struggling for quite time. I didn't hate them, but why I have to wish them well? Why I have to be somehow engaged with them? And when I have forgotten my question, the response, the answer came. I even remember I was in Germany at that time, in this uh, sabbatical year between Zambia and uh, South Africa. And then it came this from St. John of Cross when he said, Why to love those who contradict, who fail to love you? For in this way, love is begotten in a heart that has no love. He writes on this subject several times and he said that sometimes it's the only way to plant love in the heart who doesn't love. And sometimes this is the only thing which we can do, wishing well. You don't have to be engaged emotionally, socially. Wishing well. The consolation or satisfaction of our hearts is I didn't add my darkness to their darkness. I brought the mercy, grace of God to their lives. They didn't pick it up. That's their problem. I didn't add my sin to their sin. And why to do it? St. John is writing, God so acts with us, even if we don't love God. For he loves us that we might love by means of the very love he bears towards us. So he's like inviting us, take from my resources, take from my love, that you will have something to share, something to give. To stay awake means very simply, keep your relationship with God alive. Take from his grace, take from his love. Love with his love other people. And have the oil of wisdom love within you, so that your lamp can spread the light of faith that seeing our good deeds, our good actions, 
people will glorify the Almighty God.